Uh, thanks, everybody, for showing up. We'll do some quick introductions and then jump right in. My name is Daniel Kogan. I'm a group program manager in SharePoint, and my team has been working for the last year or so in building the new SharePoint framework and getting a new developer experience out the door for you folks, and we're going to spend the rest of the hour really talking about that. Thanks, Dan. I'm Bill Bear. I'm a product manager in our SharePoint product group. I spend most of my days server side. Yes, that was a pun, but I actually do since you're all devs in the room, but I spend most of my time focusing on our server, our migration program. I spend as little time as possible with Dan, which explains why I'm here. That's one of these rare occasions when I will uh, talk to our development audience and support Dan and his microphone. It's going to be it's going to be one of those hours, folks. Okay. Shall we? So before we begin, it's probably important for everybody to understand the SharePoint development background, where we came from, why we're doing what we're doing, and where we're going. So SharePoint's been around for a long time, to say the least. When we introduced SharePoint in the early 2000s, we, build, we built and matured our product in the server-rendered era. And a lot of you in the room today were building a lot of great parts, a lot of great pages, using our .NET model, a little bit of support for Ajax. And as we moved along, we've always worked on extensibility in response to industry trends and in response to technology trends. So some of the key changes we've made over time is when we introduced SharePoint Portal Server 2001, the server OM was really the way that you instrumented anything inside of SharePoint from an extensibility perspective. And that full trust code model still carries on today. At the same time, throughout the course of history with SharePoint leading into 2003 and 2007, we really started to double down on cloud. As early as 2003 when we introduced this concept we called Microsoft Managed Solutions, which eventually grew up and became Microsoft Online Services, and ultimately today you know it as Office 365. But throughout the course of that cloud development, we needed to introduce a model that provided you similar patterns and practices to that full trust model we introduced in early 2001 so you could begin to bring your solutions to the cloud. And that's when we introduced partial trust code or what you may know of today as sandbox solutions. And then as we moved throughout the course of time, technology, of course, had advanced, particularly the JavaScript programming language. We could get back to a point of distributed computing with JavaScript. So really what we did is we responded to those industry trends by doing two things. The first thing we did is we introduced the app model, or the artist formerly known as the app model, known today as add-ins. And then we introduced the SharePoint framework. But the key to the SharePoint development background is it's not a decision we take lightly when we introduce a new way of doing extensibility with SharePoint. So Dan doesn't generally wake up in the morning and say, hey, I've had an epiphany, we're going to do something new, and we're going to abandon everything that we've done. So we're very cautious about the way that we approach extensibility with SharePoint in order to help you and support you so you can respond to the same industry trends that we're designing extensibility around. So we effectively had one model when we introduced SharePoint, which was that model based on full trust code, which ultimately graduated into PTC. And then we had the second model for the client rendered era. And that's where we're at today. And that started with add-ins. Add-ins are not deprecated or made obsolete by the framework. The framework is complementary to add-ins. You can do great things in either scenario. But really what we wanted to do was get to that point to where, as a front-end web dev, you can take advantage of modern tools and technologies with SharePoint. If you think about uh, this slide particularly, think about the solutions host in the past. When you built solutions for SharePoint, your solutions host was SharePoint. That's, where you, that's what you used as your solutions host. So SharePoint is delivered to you as a product, but you leveraged it as a platform. So really the change in the industry that we're seeing is SharePoint's no longer the solutions host. It's more about cloud software as a service, client-side logic. That's what's really dominating that particular thing. Eventing, event receivers, something that everybody's probably done. We're moving in the direction of webhooks. So really as you look across this slide, what you're seeing is we're responding to trends in the industry, we're responding to trends in technology, and we're bringing that forward through our SharePoint framework. From a momentum perspective, 
We've got a lot of great feedback so far on the framework. We announced the SharePoint framework on May 4th at our launch event in San Francisco. That's when we first opened the curtains a little bit to let people know what the framework was. And then several weeks ago, we enabled you to participate in a preview program for the SharePoint framework. But from a momentum perspective, we're getting a ton of great feedback on the framework. We've had almost 3,000 unique visitors to our repo. We've had 10,000 views of Dan's video. And for being as young as the framework is, 50 forks is actually a pretty decent number for the age of the framework today, particularly because it's in preview and it's new. Our documentation is doing really well. We've had 25,000 views of that. But one of the most interesting things is developers obviously love SharePoint because on May 4th, the top trending hashtag wasn't SharePoint launch event, it was SharePoint framework, it was the top trending tag that we saw on May 4th. So there's a ton of momentum around the SharePoint framework. There's gonna be a lot more momentum as we come out of Ignite and we move forward. And then obviously, uh, for those of you that are super interested in it, we've made it easy for you so you don't even have to get up and leave. You can just sit here for the rest of your day. So with that said, kind of starting from uh, the very beginning with the SharePoint framework and the development background that led us to where we're at today, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, turn it over to Dan. One thing I would say is if you are tweeting about the session, use the hashtag BRK2114. Or the hashtag SPFX. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about why we've done what we've done, how we came around to thinking about building a new framework, and really, you know, is it new tech? Is it another thing? There's been some blogging out there around like, oh my God, Microsoft, another way of doing things. This is the fourth way in, I don't remember if it was the fourth way in three years or the third way in four years. The point being, I personally don't see this as yet another thing. It's really an extension of the way we've been doing things. And I also don't really see us as having reinvented the wheel. This is some new way of doing things. This is really us trying to put some structure around the way developers already built against SharePoint. So most developers out there today in the service, who knows what is the most commonly used web part in O365 SharePoint service? Script editor web part by orders and orders of magnitude. So we looked at that and we said, clearly there's a need and there's a desire and this is the way people do things in JavaScript today against SharePoint and yet it's really fragile, right? Uh, one of the problems was incredibly powerful. People did pretty much whatever, do, it's not past tense. People do pretty much whatever they want in the script editor web part and yet we break you, right? We don't know what you're doing, and so when we go do things in the service, we break you. And so that was one of the big things was, we're not trying to tell people what tech to use, we're trying to put some rails around it and trying to help people do things in a way that we can then stand behind and say, yep, if you do it that way, we won't break you. This is the way we encourage you to do things. So that was one of the big key things. It's we're kind of bringing SharePoint to where developers were anyway. We're not moving your cheese, as it were. Um, we knew we needed to refresh the SharePoint UI. That was just a given. SharePoint is you know 15 plus years old. It was time for us to really start thinking about a modern experience lightweight JavaScript enabled experience that was responsive and so on. And so we needed to go in this direction ourselves. And we thought we're going to bring the same tech and the same process that we use to you to build your extensions, your web parts, your UI. Um, I mentioned the responsive design aspect. So if you do things using the SharePoint framework, you're going to be able to get a responsive experience out of the box. So that's built into the way we do things in the framework. And then lastly, was we got a lot of feedback around iframes. And I'll be honest, we got the I love it feedback and the I hate it feedback. And uh, it was not evenly split, and yet there were many people who said, look, we must continue to be able to do things in an iframe. It's important for my business because of the way I do things, uh, because I have certain concerns about IP, or because of the way I distribute because I'm an ISV. And so this is not a conversation about removing that. This is a conversation about saying, 
hey, if you don't need that, or if you hate that, there's another model, and that's what this is really about. So that's sort of the high-level thinking from the product team. So when we set about building the new framework, what were we thinking? So the other slide was really our motivation. This was what we sort of held ourselves to as an engineering team. We wanted to make sure that it was all modern client-side development for obvious reasons. So that was starting point number one. It needed to be lightweight, web and mobile friendly. So we got a lot of feedback around, hey, you know, I can do all sorts of things in SharePoint, and yet when I go to my SharePoint page on my mobile phone, eh, things not so good. So that was an important part of what the framework was going to do. And I'll be really honest about that. For the first few months, I would take my engineering plans to my manager, my VP, and we said, this is what we're going to do. And they say, I don't see the word mobile. I was like, ah. I'd go back, we'd rework, I'd come back and say, look, it says mobile on the first page. And they said, yes, but. I was like, OK, I'd go. And so we were pushed, actually. It, you know, it was not our first instinct in the SharePoint developer platform to go mobile, mobile, mobile. And yet, our senior management team was pushing us really hard. And now, I feel pretty confident to say it really is mobile first. The framework is going to help you folks go and build mobile web parts that are responsive and so on. So that was a big thing for us. Um, it powers our own experiences. So what I mean by that is the SharePoint experiences that you're seeing at this conference, the new publishing pages, uh, the new libraries experience, and so on, we built on top of our framework. So unlike years past where we said, here, community, you guys use these tools, and we're going to do something different. This was really about, we're going to use the same tooling, the same tech that we ask you to use. I think that's a really important thing. It's important because you get the latest and greatest tech, but in all fairness, it's important because it keeps us honest. It was really important for us to get to the point where we inflict the same pain we do to you onto ourselves. And guess what? We're highly motivated to undo a lot of that pain when we have to deal with it. So, I think from a customer perspective, it was really important that we do that. Uh, backward, back, backwards compatibility was a really important thing for us. We wanted to make sure that once we convinced people to embrace this framework, it wasn't a, oh, but sometimes I need to go back and do the old way. If you're going to build web parts, you should really be using the SharePoint framework. The new SharePoint framework web parts will work on your classic SharePoint pages. We've done a lot of work. They appear in the same web part gallery from an end user perspective. They look and feel pretty much like the old web parts when you're in the classic page. And so there's really no need for you to make a decision as to what tech I'm going to use for my web part. If you're going to build your next web part, you should think about the framework. And then it was really an open source conversation. And this is, I think, where you really see a change in the way that the SharePoint engineering team sees the world. I can't imagine a year, certainly not two years ago, me being on stage talking about all the open source tooling that not only we use internally, but that we're encouraging you folks to use. So this is a big change for us, an important part of the new framework. So with that, what are the things that we imagine you're going to do with the framework? It's really about building custom web parts today. The framework is the way that we imagine you go to build new tech that you're going to introduce to your end users. And it's also the way that we see you going forward and enhancing SharePoint in other ways. And so you might notice that I'm couching my words a little bit there. Uh, today, it's about web parts. Going forward, it will be a lot more than web parts. But we felt that it was important for us to focus on one very specific scenario so that we could get the framework out the door and stable before we sort of got ahead of ourselves, which used to be we did a bunch of stuff and then we sort of figured it out later. We're trying to be much more deliberate and focused now and say it's really about web parts. We're going to get to the other stuff in a little bit. So the scenarios are 
today about adding business value to your scenarios through the creation of web parts. Which is a magic button there, that one? So there we go. This is really a conversation about how we use the framework. So I made the statement earlier, the engineering team uses SharePoint framework internally themselves. This is not something that we sort of push out the door for you folks. So if you look at the modern pages, modern pages today use this framework in order to give you the experience that you have, which probably, uh, who's seen the new publishing page? Let's start with that. Okay, a bunch of you. So the experience that you see in the publishing page today is probably unlike anything you recognize SharePoint to be. And that's really because the framework allows us to do a lot of lightweight, smooth interaction between us and the user. Uh, the new toolbars, the new uh, uh, toolbox, excuse me, the new web parts, new property panes, all of that is built in. The canvas, you get all of that because you're using the new SharePoint technology that we're shipping. The magical button doesn't work. The authoring canvas, which I just mentioned, is an important part of the new publishing experience, and it too was created using the framework. So uh, I mentioned the toolbox. The toolbox is a place where you're gonna spend most of your time as an end user picking business functionality, right? You're either gonna be typing, creating content, or in the toolbox, picking the next widget that you wanna add to your page and then configuring it. Uh, the toolbox is an experience unlike anything we've had in SharePoint, I think. In the past it was, you go three menus deep and you find the thing you need and then you bring it into the right zone and then you go and you configure. And we've heard loud and clear, it's important for us to be much smoother, much lighter in context for the end user. And so now, as you're typing your content, you have the little hint, you're gonna be able to click on something, you're gonna be able to pick the web part and configure the web part. It sounds obvious, but you guys are all SharePoint people, right? That's just not the SharePoint we all recognize. And so we're actually pretty proud of ourselves. It may not seem that way to you guys, but we're quite proud of the fact that you can now just simply add things to a page without having to go to SharePoint school. So I mentioned the open source tooling. Um, we'll come to these in a little bit and talk about them in a little bit more detail. But this is an important change for SharePoint, an important change for the way we do things, an important change for the way we ask you to do things. And there's a few parts here. There's, there's the tech that we use when we run our web parts, the way we build our web parts. There's the tech that we use for the development environment using Node and Gulp locally, using Yeoman to build the scaffolding of your project, TypeScript, the tech that you're gonna be working in, and then uh, Visual Studio Code, and then React is the framework that we've picked. And I'm being very deliberate about saying it's a framework that we've picked. It's not the framework you need to pick. There's infinite frameworks out there. Every week there's a new one. We've decided, and I tell this story a lot, but we tried at the beginning to pick the right framework. And uh, we picked a framework and we'd say, okay, we picked one and someone would say, oh, what about this one? We'd be like, ooh, haven't heard that one. We go back and we think about the next one and we say, okay, now we've evaluated all of them and we pick one and they'd say, oh, what about this other one? We'd be like, and we, I kid you not, we did that for about three or four months in Redmond, trying to pick the framework until we realized we will never pick the framework. Right, because it doesn't matter what we pick, next month, next year, there's gonna be something else. And so we were very deliberate at the end by saying, look, we're gonna settle on a framework because we have a team of hundreds of engineers and I don't want every team to go and pick some random framework. And yet, you guys are free to pick whatever you want. You can go build your web part in whatever framework you want. We also deliver, not my team, but SharePoint and Microsoft in general, the Office Fabric, uh, UI Fabric, and there's a React version of that. And so if you wanna go build web parts and make them look and feel like SharePoint, this is the best tool you have. Use our framework, use the fabric, 
build web parts that look and feel like the rest of SharePoint. Now, I've heard some people say, well, I don't want it to look like the rest of SharePoint. That's fine, too. If you want to do your own thing, you're welcome to do that. So, ah, I got ahead of myself. So the React framework, very quickly, I already discussed that, so I don't think we need to dwell on it. So client-side web parts. We've talked about them now for a few minutes. What are client-side web parts? Why do people care? What do we do with them? So the web part, and I think I'm speaking to an audience that understands, but the web part is really the way that we deliver business value, right? This is a way that someone is going to add some business-specific process or value or something that they need that is unique to them that we don't ship out of the box. You can go build the web part that does that for you. The web parts themselves reside in SharePoint and reside in a CDN. So we're going to talk a little bit about how we deploy and package in a few minutes. But the way you want to think about these web parts is you build the web part, you run the JavaScript in a CDN, you have the web part itself with the manifest sitting in the app catalog in SharePoint. So that's sort of the new world, which is a little bit different than what we've done in the past. Don't advance yet. So I think one of the important, one of the important things to take away from this slide is when, we, when Dan started the very beginning of the conversation, one of the key things that he honed in on was he was very deliberate to talk about how today our focus is on web parts. That's current state. And why is web parts, or why are web parts a point of emphasis for us and the framework? And largely, if, as Dan said, if you think about the way that users add functionality to SharePoint or they work with SharePoint, anytime an information worker, somebody who's sitting in front of SharePoint wants to do something with it or wants to extend it, they do that by virtue of the web part. Whether that's adding a web part to surface business data uh, via anything from SSRS to performance point services or whatever other technology they choose to use. They're configurable, they're flexible, so users can use them in many different ways. So really our focus was is what's going to have the most impact initially with the SharePoint framework? What are developers going to be able to do to impact the information worker in the best possible way? And the simple answer to that was web parts. Let's focus on web parts. The framework doesn't change the aspect of the web part. A web part is a web part is a web part. The only thing that really differentiates a web part built yesterday to a web part built today is the underlying tooling and technology that you're using to build those. And of course, they can run anywhere as well. So SharePoint framework web parts aren't limited to just these new modern experiences that Dan talked about. So you've seen some of those, whether it's lists and libraries, the authoring canvas, many of those things are modern experiences by our definition. It doesn't mean that anything you build with the, shame, with the uh, SharePoint framework is going to be limited to being deployed on those type of pages. They can be deployed on classic pages as well. And that comes back to the backward compatibility principle on the principle slide. And then it's web framework agnostic, and that's the most important thing. So we did have to align to a specific framework. It'd be really hard for us to actually build an extensibility model if each engineer got to choose to do whatever they wanted to do. They tried. They, they tried. They, they, they did. They but tried. But what we wanted to do for you was make it web framework agnostic because we know everybody likes what they like. Me in particular, I love jQuery, and everybody laughs and says you must be really old if, you're, uh, <laughs> if you like jQuery, but I like jQuery. And uh, somebody like Dan might like handlebars. But we really wanted to give you the ability to choose what works best in your scenario. And then the next key is we want to be able to support both Office 365 and SharePoint on premises. So one of the things we talked about on May 4th was this concept of feature packs. One of the things that we talked about with the framework was is we're endeavoring to bring the framework back to on premises through this new delivery model that we have. And really there's a ton of value in us doing that. Just like uh, in the past we used to have two ways of doing one thing. Now we have one way of doing one thing. We're delivering tooling to you that aligns our, both our first and third party development. So we're doing things in the way that you're doing things. And then on the other side, we understand that you need to be more efficient as well. And if you're a partner that's building solutions, one of the biggest challenges you've always had is you've had to build one way for on-premises and you've had to build one way in the cloud. So you had to maintain two separate branches just to do one thing for your customers or your users. So really, 
when we're saying we want to be able to bring it to on-prem as well, we want to give you one way of doing one thing. So you can build portable solutions and you can follow your users from on-prem to the cloud. You can follow your customers from on-prem to the cloud, but you can apply the same patterns and practices and you're not rebuilding things over and over and over again just to get to your destination. So on that note, since the obvious question is now going to be when, um, so I, I'm not about, I'm not prepared or about to say when it'll be on-prem. Uh, what I do want to say is the nature of the way that we've sort of undertaken this journey is we're going to release to the cloud. We're in preview right now. We're going to take some time to get well-baked and go to GA. And some point after GA, we will find the next ship vehicle to get to on-prem. So we're, we're not committed to a date, but we are committed to shipping on-prem. We think it's super important. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I want to be able to have a conversation with a developer about the web part that they're going to build, not about the tech that they're going to pick, because they should be picking the framework. They should no longer have to pick the old server-side web part model. So in order for that to be true, we need to get to the on-prem server environment. It's going to take us a little bit of time, but we'll get there. OK. So let's go ahead and uh, switch gears a little bit, take a look at a few things that you can do with the framework. So I'm going to ask you uh, very quickly to kind of brace yourselves. This is going to blow you away. But this is a, a great example of something that you can do with the SharePoint framework. So here we go. And uh, so I went ahead and I built that this morning using the uh, <laughs> SharePoint framework. Actually, I didn't. The whole point of this is we talked a little bit this morning, and as we've talked about the framework, we've talked about JavaScript. JavaScript, JavaScript, JavaScript. Why the emphasis on JavaScript? For most developers that uh, didn't like JavaScript 15 years ago, that still don't like JavaScript today, the association that you probably have with JavaScript is that. The compelling alert, the compelling things that you could do 15, 20 years ago. You could generate an alert and you could annoy everybody because it doesn't do anything other than annoy people. So, But everybody, whole, everybody saw it. Okay. Everybody got to see your alert. Everybody got to see the alert. There and then, of course, you could put a button on it, which actually didn't do anything. There was really no interaction with anything when it came to JavaScript in the past. And as I said earlier, JavaScript technologies have advanced substantially, exponentially, you know, since that point in time. So if you, again, have not been following what industry trends, the industry trends of today, it's become a more powerful language than it had ever been in the early days of, of JavaScript. Just like the uh, GIF, or GIF, however you choose to pronounce it, has made an epic comeback. Everybody used to hate them, because everybody used to put 400 of them on their site. But uh, you know they've come back, and we've actually found a use for you know, that type of technology, much as we found great uses for JavaScript. Some of the other things that you can do with the framework is the framework supports this concept that we call the SharePoint Workbench. What is the SharePoint Workbench? Well, very quickly, if you look at the URL, I'm running this locally. That's effectively localhost, and I've got a dedicated port assigned to it. So the SharePoint framework enables me to build solutions in a way to where I don't have to struggle with the older models of development where I had to have a development workstation. If I was building for on-premises, I had to install SharePoint on my development workstation. Or perhaps I had to have a developer site somewhere so I could build my solutions. And unfortunately, when you're doing live development, you're deploying, you're retracting, you're deploying, you're retracting, and you're pulling back and forth. And the workbench enables you to do a lot of your build test iteration cycles locally. You're going to so, say something. Yeah. So if you remember at the beginning, one of the principles was you know, we wanted to use the tools that you are going to use. And I said, that sort of motivated us to go fix a bunch of problems. This is a prime example of that. So in all sincerity, this was built by our development team for themselves. And when we saw what they were doing, we said, well, wouldn't our customers want to do the exact same thing? And they're like, well, sure, we could give it to them. And so this is a kind of sort of development that's going to happen as we move forward, because we're using the same tools and the same tech that we ask you to use. We're going to feel the pain earlier. We're going to fix that. And you're going to be the beneficiaries of that sort of uh, cycle. So. Yeah, so that's the great, the great part about the workbench is, one, that it does allow you to build locally. Two, you can do all of your iterations locally before you actually bring your solution to the cloud. So again, you don't struggle with a lot of the deployment 
and provisioning aspects that some of the earlier models of, of SharePoint extensibility had introduced. So there's great benefit in being able to do that. You can actually sit on a plane and you don't have to pay for GoGo. -Go. You can build your solution directly there with no connectivity back to SharePoint. In my particular case, we've got the workbench here. And I'll show you uh, one of the examples that we'll show you this morning is based on a lot of the tutorials that you may find on GitHub or you may have found here at the conference. So how many people in the room have looked at some of the SharePoint framework tutorials that we've published on GitHub? So quite a few of you have seen some of those. And it starts with the simple Hello World web part, then you're talking to SharePoint, then you're interacting with a page, and then you're including a uh, popular library, jQuery UI, and we give you a great example of how you can build a static accordion and effectively leverage the part as a container for some other technologies. So really what, I've, what we're going to show you is how you can pull all of those together. So if you haven't walked through the tutorials, the tutorials will get you to a point to where you can start to figure out how to, mu how to munge all of these different things together. So here I am in my workbench, and I've got my little jQuery UI widget web part that I've built. So I told you I'm old school. I like jQuery. So many of you have probably seen the jQuery accordion widget at jQueryUI.com. It's a very popular widget. They have a number of different widgets that people like to use. In my particular case, the one thing that we're doing differently here is that I'm not building a static accordion. What I'm doing is building a dynamic accordion. The thing that's separating static from dynamic in this particular case is I've got my accordion widget. Looks pretty cool. I can navigate around. And as you can see, it says mock list one, mock list two, mock list three, mock list four. Why does it say mock list one through four? Because I'm building locally. I don't have any connectivity to SharePoint. But the easy thing you can do with the framework is you can introduce a mock HTTP client where you can set up your list definition. So if you do want to work with list data and see what the list data looks like, but you don't have connectivity back to SharePoint because you're building lake locally, you can build your mock client. And then you can make a call to that mock client depending on where your web part loads, whether your web part's loading in the local workbench or whether your web part's loading live inside of SharePoint. The other thing you'll notice is this is all TypeScript. What is TypeScript? It's a type superset of JavaScript that compiles to plain JavaScript. So, you know, TypeScript's not a new language that we're introducing to you. It's a type superset of JavaScript. So effectively, TypeScript starts and ends with JavaScript. So coming back over here real quick, we made uh, a local call to our mock HTTP client so we could load up this accordion. But what does it look like inside of SharePoint? So here I am inside of a SharePoint site. This is my development site collection. And I've got the workbench hosted here as well so I can manipulate my part using live data. So I can go ahead and add my same jQuery UI accordion widget. And the first thing it's going to tell me is that no list has been selected. I can go ahead and open the tool pane and begin to work with some lists. So if you think about some of the tutorials that many of you have walked through, what we're doing is pulling all of those together to show you some of the power that the framework can provide to you. So in this particular case now, I can go ahead and make a call, or the web part already has. It's already made its call, and it's pulled all of the lists for me that are available on my particular site. So as you can see, I've got a number of lists. They're available right over here on this side, or the lists I care about, a list for our breakout session, as well as SharePoint Labs. So coming back, I can pick the SharePoint sessions. So I'm just going to scroll down a little bit and say SharePoint Framework Sessions. And You'll notice I have an apply button, and that's an option as well that we give you with the SharePoint framework. So your property pane can be reactive or non-reactive. In my particular case, I want it to be non-reactive. I want users to commit every change because I don't want them choosing a list, filtering, choosing a list, filtering. So I'm going to hit apply, and as you can see, what I've done is I've actually pulled the list into the jQuery accordion UI widget. So this is an example of taking something that's really been designed for static data a third-party solution, a third-party widget that's designed for static data and using it in a dynamic way through the SharePoint framework. So we could look at the same list right over here, SharePoint framework sessions. So this is the list view that you get outside, inside of SharePoint natively, or we can pop over here and we can actually give our users a more compelling use case scenario. Accordions are actually great if your real estate is limited. 
So now I've got all of my sessions here, and I can work back and forth. Well, if I'm the end user, maybe I don't like the uh, performance of this part. Looks pretty clunky, pretty choppy as I navigate. So I can also introduce jQuery effects and interactions if I wanted to. So I can crank up, if I was the user, the animation speed. So as the developer, I'm giving my users some options for how they can configure their part. And all I'm doing is leveraging, again, I'm leveraging a popular JavaScript library. So now we can go in, and we have a much smoother effect. So as you can see, that's quite a bit smoother than it was in the past. How many people have ever added a web part to a page? Probably everybody. Great. So how many people have chose edit web part and went to the little layout group? Well, it's great because it gives you a couple of options. You can adjust the height and width of the web part. And it takes a specific number of pixels. So you can say, I want it to be 400 pixels wide and 600 pixels tall. That's pretty awesome, unless you're an information worker that has no concept of what a pixel is. They don't even know what their resolution is. So it wasn't really intuitive to give a user a way to configure a web part that's based on principles that are most applicable to a power user or a developer. So in our particular case, because of the power of JavaScript, I can just simply make my web part resizable. It's not adjust height with apply, adjust height with apply. And that's the cycle that users would go through. I can just say, you know what? I want it to be resizable. Click apply. You notice down here. Now this is a much easier way for a user to rationalize the height and width of a web part. I just pull it back and forth very easily using JavaScript. And as you can see, from a performance perspective, it's fast. Maybe, though, I also want it to be sortable. If you've ever sorted a SharePoint list, it's painful. It's not very easy to do. And there really is no real mechanism for me to go in here and rearrange this list. They're based on the order that I created each item. But using JavaScript, using the SharePoint framework, I've made it sortable. So now I can say, you know what? This session is actually a really good session. I want this guy to be on top, or maybe I want this guy to be at the bottom. So I can actually move around, and now I can manipulate my list and resort my list in real time. So really what I'm doing is giving users all of the functionality that they've always wanted that SharePoint didn't give them natively. So we'll go ahead and pop out of this real quick. I'm going to drop the part, and I'm going to add it again. Let's put the part back in here. But it goes beyond that as well, because at Microsoft, we've introduced a number of new technologies from an extensibility perspective, from a forms perspective, from a workflow perspective, Power Apps, Flow, and of course the SharePoint framework. The other thing I can do as well is I can leverage uh, something like Flow if I wanted to, to uh, actually build a part that's a little bit more dynamic. So the part that you saw was a list-based part that derived data from an existing list inside of my SharePoint site. This one does the same thing, the BRK2114 list. The difference is, is, hey, look, people are tweeting about our session. So effectively, what I've done is I've actually brought in Microsoft Flow into my web part as well. So now I have Flow interrogating tweets using the hashtag BRK2114, taking those tweets and collecting them as list items in a SharePoint list and then exposing them through the SharePoint framework in the jQuery accordion. So I can see what Patrick is saying about the session. I can actually scroll down. I can see what Kirk is saying. I can go again and see what Jeff is saying. So, so it's really, there's really a number of different things you can do. But the reason I wanted to show you that is because the SharePoint framework doesn't live in isolation. You can actually bring a number of other things into the framework as well. So you can combine it with the power of flow and some of the other technologies we've introduced. Yeah, I, I think these examples are, the, the important things that I want you to take away from the example are a few. The workbench, the new tool that we've introduced that allows you to build locally or build locally and have context and a connection to your tenant, right? So that's an important subtlety that people sort of gloss over a lot, which is I can either run the workbench on my local machine or I can run the workbench in my tenant and then when I execute the web part, it's going to grab the JavaScript from my local machine and the content from my tenant. So as a developer, you're going to be able to quickly iterate on how that thing is getting 
executed and making changes without ever having to go and upload the web part again and keep doing that process. That's a really important thing, especially as you start to get into these complex scenarios like um, Bill was showing where you really care about the finesse of the experience, how smooth it's going to be, or bringing external data in and so on. You don't want to have to keep uploading that web part every time. So it makes a huge difference for us. Yeah, and one of the other things as well is, uh, as, as Dan said, you don't want to keep uploading it and iterating upon it and then going through that cycle each and every time. It's more efficient to be able to build it and then bring it live uh, in a way to where there's consistency between building locally and building in the cloud. The other thing, too, that the workbench affords you is how many people have tested their web part for mobile? And how do you generally do that? You browse to the site on a mobile device. That's not a great way to develop a part. The beauty part about the workbench is it also allows me to preview it. So I can take it and say, oh, this is what my part looks like on uh, this particular form factor. And it's fully functional. So as you can see, I can actually work my way through. But what about <clears throat> if the user holds their uh, mobile device in a different way? So I can actually go back and uh, shift around. So let me just uh, come back to the mobile preview. So as you can see, that's if the user is holding the device vertical. Maybe I want to see what my part looks like when they're holding their device horizontally. So now I've got the device over here in my web part horizontally. The other thing, too, is what about tablets? Very quickly, I can say, hey, let's emulate a tablet. This is the tablet design. But what if they're holding their tablet vertically? So I can actually preview these things as I build them. So testing for responsiveness and mobility is really easy through the workbench as well, whether you're doing that locally or whether you're doing that in the cloud. So this was just really a very simple example that pulls together all of the tutorials that you will find on, uh, on GitHub as well as here at the conference. We have a couple of them. And to give you an idea of where you can find those, you can actually go in here. And uh, let's see if I can find some of those for you. So let's look at another list, because I believe we have some tutorials here at the conference available for you. And there they are. So basically what I've done through these tutorials is I've actually pulled all of them together to build one monolithic part. So I've taken from the very basic part, the Hello World web part, I then talked to SharePoint, and I interrogated a list for its data. So I followed through with that lab. So effectively, if you think about these labs and you follow them all the way through, you can build the equivalent of what we've just shown you today. So that's the power of the framework, but not only the power of the framework, but the ease of the framework for your front-end web developer. Great. So we've been talking about this particular web part that uh, Bill built. We've been on a bit of a journey for the last, I'm going to say, close to a year, working both in Redmond and with the community, trying to make sure that what we're building is what people are asking for. We are in preview right now and are feeling really good. We are, I believe, on our fourth drop of the framework preview. So we've taken a bunch of feedback, done a bunch of work. Uh, we've been working. We got to switch slides. here. We've been working with the community and had a bit of a hackathon. And uh, last night we had an awards dinner where we handed out some awards. But uh, I want to show you a web part that was built by one of our partners, uh, Powell365, who won the first place in our little competition. Uh, the guys are in the room right here, so I'm going to ask them to just stand for a sec. Stand up, guys. There you go. Yeah. Um, I'm going to show you their web part in just a sec. But my, my point in all this is, Yes, we're in preview, but we're feeling pretty good. I mean, there's still bugs to fix, and there's still going to be work for us to do, and we're never going to be done because there's always going to be something. But it's pretty stable. It's functional. It's available. So if you guys want to do work with the framework, it's there. Please get to it. Now, with that, I'm going to just do a very quick, cool little demo. So the guys at PAL365 built a web part that allows me to show my groups in any page. So I'm looking at a page. Um, let me just go to edit mode for a sec just to show you how this works. So this was, I'm in the gallery. And in the gallery, I have the web part that they built. And when I added that web part, uh, no need to do it twice so I don't have to configure it. But I go here. 
this is a web part that I get. It shows me all the groups, brings in the group icons. It represents them really nicely. I can have my favorite groups. When I go to my group, I get this pop-out panel that's really cool. It has access to all the things that my group has. I can say whether it's a favorite or not. It shows me the members of the group. And then this is pretty neat. I can go in here, and in line, I can respond to some conversation that that group is having. So this is really, and this is why they won, this is a really cool and simple example of the kind of work that a team can do. And I'm going to be honest, they only had a couple of weeks. I don't know, they probably worked maybe three-ish, four weeks. I assume they have other jobs. So they didn't spend that much time on it. And it's a really functional, easy to use, beautiful web part that you can just go and bring value by saying, hey, this is content in O365. How do I bring it to this page? How do I interact with this content in a way that I don't have to send my user away somewhere else? And that's really how we imagine web parts bringing business value to a page. I'm sitting on a team site. I have a publishing page. I want to show something. Use a web part. That's really the, the, the basic story there. So with that, so way to go, guys. Congratulations. OK, on that note, let's talk. Yeah, come on. Yeah, OK. Um, let's talk about once the guys, and this is not just Apollo guys, but once the guys at Apollo 365 built a web part, how do they get it out there? How do they put it into the service? And so there's really a few things that you have to think about. I mentioned earlier that the web parts now are kind of these two halves of a web part that you need to understand. You have a package. We'll talk about how we produce the package in a second using Gulp. Once you've produced the package, you have two parts. You have the part that goes into SharePoint, which is really a manifest file and the provisioning logic. So if your web part needs a backing list or has some, something that it needs in SharePoint, that's in SharePoint itself. And then you have content that is probably, it could be in SharePoint, but it doesn't need to be, likely in a CDN, the JavaScript, and the resource files. And that's sort of the model that we imagine. You can put your own CDN out there. You can use a commercial CDN. You can use the new CDN from Microsoft for SharePoint that is in preview today, so you can configure a SharePoint library to be backed by a CDN. All of those models work. There's a document that we've published on how to configure your CDN if this is something that's sort of interesting to you. It's not required. You don't have to use a CDN. But we heard from a lot of people that that is a preferred model on how to deploy this stuff. Because frankly, as I said earlier, once you get your web part deployed, if you need to make a change from the developer's perspective, you just go and upload new versions of your JavaScript to the CDN. You don't ever have to touch the you know, 5,000 site collections that use that thing. So it makes for a really quick and simple model for deployment. So that's an important part of how we imagine the framework delivering on packaging and so on. So we've talked a lot about why we want to build web parts. We've talked a lot about the value of web parts. How do we actually do this? So I mentioned earlier that there's a bunch of open source tooling. Uh, there's two sessions back to back to back. Well, that would be three. Uh, there's two more sessions in this hall uh, where you can get a really deep dive on how you do this. There's a session on the future of development in SharePoint, another session on actually building a web part where Chuck is going to walk through the nuts and bolts of building a web part. But I want to talk about just the tool chain. So you would install the SharePoint generator, which is a Yeoman generator on your local developer machine. What that gives you is a Yeoman uh, template, a framework, essentially, or the scaffolding, as we call it, for your project. So that'll give you a way to start to build your new web part. Today, you get a Yeoman template for web parts. That's a hint, right? Today, it's about web parts. Uh, there will be others. Today, you get a Yeoman template for web parts. And, and Yeoman is effectively a generator ecosystem. SharePoint happens to participate in it. As Dan said, the uh, generator itself will scaffold for you your part as you begin to build it. If you're familiar with Visual Studio, it's not that much different than project structure creating that. Great. So 
Once you've done that, you're going to be able to use Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code. Today, it's Visual Studio Code. We're getting to Visual Studio. And you use Gulp. Gulp Serve locally is a thing that's going to be able to generate and render your uh, JavaScript for you. You're going to be able to test and iterate locally, as uh, Bill mentioned earlier, using the Workbench. You're going to be able to also use the Workbench in your tenant so that you have sort of one more step of testing. Once you're kind of feeling comfortable with it, you're going to then be able to go and use real data in context of SharePoint. You're going to iterate there for a while, I would imagine. And then you're going to use Gulp to produce the package. And this is what I mentioned earlier. Gulp allows you to build the packages that you need to deploy to the CDN and that you will upload to the SharePoint app catalog. So the output of this thing is really just an app. So if you know the SharePoint add-ins model and you know how to put an app in the app catalog, that's what you're going to get. Just drag and drop the file, put it in the app catalog. And then there's one last step, which is once you've put it into the app catalog, you need to actually apply that app to the site collection. So if you want the web parts in site collection one or site collection two, you would go there and add the app. And the app is really one or many web parts that are in that package. So you do the gulp, build the package, deploy it, and you're done, right? Depending on how you've configured things, you may have already deployed to the CDN, you may not. You may run your code directly from a library in SharePoint. That's your business. But at the end of the day, for all of you that are trying to take that picture, let me give you the right picture. There you go. Uh, that's really the workflow of how you should imagine building web parts in this new framework world. So many of us that have been doing this for a long time have a bunch of preconceived notions about JavaScript, about the tools, about TypeScript, about Node, and so on. Um, I, I decided, I, I stole this slide from one of the guys on my team, but he had it because it was important to explain, and I, I felt I needed this slide because if you're old enough, this is probably the way you see the world, and you're saying, why are you making me move away from this world? This world made so much sense to me. It's so easy for me to understand. And what we're saying is, uh, for the college graduates or the cool kids in the room, or for the rest of us, this is the way we need to learn to understand the world. So there's a really simple mapping of how the things that people already understood should map. This should not feel scary. This is basically a brand of something else that you already understand, right? You should already understand what, you know, IS does for you, and you should think of Node as your local version of that. You already understand the Nougat, and you should think of uh, NPM as that. You should, so there's a bunch of tooling that you get, and all we've done is change the names on you. Ah, we've done more than that. But, but really, that's the way you should feel about it. This should not be some dramatic change of the way you see the world. You should get comfortable with mapping it to the way you understand things. So if you need to take something away from this talk and say, what am I going to do with the framework? Or what do I need to go think about with the framework? We've heard the feedback many times, and so I'm going to call it out before someone calls it out for me. It's TypeScript. If you haven't played with TypeScript and you're going to go start building web parts, I encourage you to spend some time learning, thinking, understanding TypeScript. It should not be rocket science. It should not be that difficult for most people. But yes, it's a change. I think the rest of these things, Node and Yeoman, it's a change, but it's, it's not a dramatic change. It's just a different tool. TypeScript is a place where a lot of people keep raising their hand and say, really, do I have to use TypeScript? Yes. Yeah, anyway. I think for most developers that, that have an adversity to JavaScript, it's usually just due to its loose nature. And TypeScript helps solve some of that by putting some structure to it as well. And again, as I said, it's, it's effectively TypeScript is JavaScript. It's uh, the semantics that you're using. It's a type superset. But it does enable you to build in a way, if you're familiar with C Sharp, to build in a way that's very similar, that, that abstracts some of the looseness that is associated with JavaScript independently. And then looking at the tooling, just to make a comment on that, the tooling's not only great because it's lightweight 
and it enables you to do things the way that you've probably been trying to do them already. It also enables greater agility as well. We can update by dropping new drops to the framework as we've been doing. We're on drop four and preview. The other things we can do is the uh, SharePoint generator. We can update that SharePoint generator and you just have it immediately because all you have to do is fire up Node and then you're just gonna update or fire up Yeoman, you're just gonna update your generator. It's that simple. Yep. And uh, in the past, that took a dependency on shipping a Visual Studio update to you. Well, one of the things, just on that topic, so on the Yeoman generator, for example, today when you use a generator, if you go through the lab work or as you start playing with it, or you'll see in the other sessions, the Yeoman generator will ask you, what JavaScript framework would you like? None, that's an easy one. React, knockout, and there we stop. Now, the truth of the matter is, over time, there's going to be more options there, right? You're going to be able to go and pick a Yeoman generator template for whatever framework flavor of the month, right? So we're going to be able to very quickly react, pardon the pun, uh, to the way people are doing things, to what's trendy, to you know, the latest and greatest thing that we hadn't even heard of in Redmond three weeks ago, and suddenly it's a cool thing. It allows us to stay flexible without having to go and ship something big every couple of years. So I think that's a really important difference, right? The way that we're going to be able to deliver value to you as developers, it's going to be quick. We're, we really intend to make that a, a very quick turnover. OK, so with that. So roadmap, uh, without putting specific dates to, yeah, no dates to a lot of these, what do you have right now? You have uh, sites on Microsoft Graph Preview. Obviously, uh, the Microsoft Graph is our single endpoint for insights, intelligence, and data from Microsoft Cloud Services. So we have sites on Graph and Preview. We also have our client uh, side web parts for classic uh, pages preview. So you can begin to build those. That was the preview program that we announced several weeks ago. We uh, just recently announced, uh, almost uh, shortly before the conference itself, our SharePoint webhooks preview. And then the uh, SharePoint and Power App integration preview as well to uh, also include flow. So all of those previews are available today. Later, uh, you'll have GA of many of these. So whether that's webhooks, power apps, uh, flow, client-side web parts for modern pages preview is gonna be the later. It takes a dependency on having modern pages for you to be able to do so. So today's preview is based on classic pages. The next preview will be based on modern pages. So that just shows the extent of backward compatibility that you have because the preview didn't start with the newest tech, started with the oldest tech. So that's kind of the roadmap in a nutshell. So there's a number of things that you can start doing today. And then over the course of the remainder of the year leading into next year and beyond, we're going to land a lot of these as well. We are. Yes, we, yes, we are. We absolutely are. No, uh, I, I really do feel very confident about where we're going with this. I mean, we've had tons of feedback. Uh, we've reacted to so much of it. I, you know, it's, it's hard for me to just stand up here and say we've been doing a great job. But uh, the development team in Redmond really has been getting feedback and making changes daily. You know, we've had four drops uh, of the framework just in a couple of weeks because we're trying to make sure that the way that we deliver this is as friction-free as possible. It will never be frictionless, but we're, we're going to get to that. So with that, uh, I assume there are questions. We're very deliberate about leaving some time for questions because I imagine that there's going to be lines of people at the microphones, which there's people running out the door. That's not quite what I had in mind. Um, <laughs> if you're leaving now and you took a sticker, put it back. No. Uh, <laughs> OK, so with that, if there are questions, uh, I'm happy to take some questions. I also know there's some other members of the team in the room that could help. Uh, but for now, let's open up the mics. Oh, and uh, if you are leaving, fill out the surveys, give feedback. OK. And Bill's not being rude. He has another session three See, miles away somewhere in some other building. Yeah, unfortunately, and so uh, he's going to run. Unfortunately, the convention center is big enough to get from one side to the other. You have to pass through customs. So, uh, <laughs> OK, so with that, there's a gentleman at the mic. Yeah, I, I actually saw the Donner party last week dead on, on the side. When I was going to one of Sorry, the what was that? I saw the Donner party, like some of them dead. Oh, yeah, yeah. One of the free conference sessions. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, 
I'm trying to understand how different this is from visual, uh, visual web parts and the app model from Visual Studio two, or, or from SharePoint 2013. So, I mean, in the app model, you could build, uh, yep. you had to build client side if it was SharePoint. Right, so, so let me, very quick. So the question is, how different is it from the add-in model? It's different in that there was, there's no requirement on the iframe which was a big request of people. Uh, we, we had, uh, the added model continues to exist. They're in parallel, we're not trying to replace it. In fact, we're doing quite a bit of work to enhance it. And so if your solution requires an add-in because of isolation and other sort of things that you get from the add-in model, totally fine. Uh, this was really intended to be a much lighter weight and as I said earlier, it's a way to put rails around what people are doing in the script editor web part already. Uh, I don't see, there's only one mic? Okay. There's, oh, this gentleman. I can't see, I have lights in front. Yes. Uh, do you plan to allow us to extend or customize new list experience with the SharePoint framework? Do we uh, intend to allow you to customize which? New list experience. Oh, the new list experience. Uh, yes. We, there's a session by uh, Lincoln Damaris somewhere someday this week. Uh, he owns the list experience, and we will be doing work to ensure that you're going to be able to put uh, JavaScript back into the list experience. It will be managed in a way that's different from what you did today, which was Wild West, we had no idea and we broke you, but we heard the feedback and we're being very deliberate about making sure that that works. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll just keep going back and forth, so. Just same question I wanted to enhance. Basically, the recently Microsoft introduced the modern UI for the Office 365 SharePoint Online, and without a master page, what is the roadmap plan for the customization and branding for the SharePoint team side? So, there's, so what is the roadmap for customization going forward? Uh, we are working through that plan. We are not shipping it, and so we're not discussing it at this conference in detail uh, with regards to how we do custom sites using the new framework, but we're working through that plan. Uh, I'll go here. Uh, so a couple questions. One, yep. um, what's the deployment process for on-prem? So the deployment process for on-prem starts with, I need to ship to on-prem, which I have not done yet. Uh, once we do that, it really is essentially the same. You're going to be able to take a package and put it directly into the app catalog and then use that app catalog item to install into the site collections. Whether your on-prem environment actually has a CDN associated to it is really a function of how you installed and architected your on-prem environment. You do not require the CDN, so it's really just applying an app to the app catalog, nothing different than that. Also, so you're doing it all in React. You guys chose that. Yep. Um, as far as examples and templates, are you bringing out just React versions no. of that? No. So we chose React, and I, I'm going to be really blunt about this. Do not see that as a statement of one is better than the other. We simply had to make a choice in order to align 400 engineers. We couldn't just be random. Uh, the, every framework has its advantage and disadvantage. We're very clear about that. People will prefer one over the other. We will be doing our samples on day one in React because we're really just sharing things that we've built. But we will be encouraging the PMP team, which also reports to me, to be doing samples in other frameworks. And we're going to be engaging with the community to ensure that there are other samples, uh, web parts, and other things in other frameworks. So, that's an important part of the strategy, and we're going to focus on that. I'll go here. Uh, you showed us a mobile preview, right? Mobile yep. preview yep. for the, uh, the preview. Yeah, the previewer, yeah. Is it like a simulator? Is it interactive? No, it's, it's just a simulator inside of the workbench. So it's basically what we do is rather than asking you to shrink the browser to the right size, mm -hmm. we know exactly the height and width that it should be, and we just reduce your uh, JavaScript to run in that height and width, and so you get the experience of what it would look like if someone had reduced the size of the screen, that's all. But that doesn't take care of the form factor of the platform OS, because those were generic mobile and... Yeah, it's uh, just generic. It's just, it's just height and width, so that you can compress it and very quickly see how the flow is, because 
The biggest problem that people have when building web part is I build my web part, the page flows nicely, and my web part sticks out, and it, my phone's this wide, and my web part's that wide. And so what this does is it just says, hey, if the screen were this wide, what would happen? And that's all. So it's, it's, a, it's not an emulator. It's really just a very simple UI uh, overlay of what you're seeing. It I'm going to go. Great if it, could be Sorry? Into, it would be great if it, it could be evolved into that. It, it absolutely would be. Thank and uh, we'll be doing a bit, quite a bit more work on the, frame, uh, on the workbench. So expect more there. It's V1. Uh, I'm going to do a couple more, and then I will get off stage and have a huddle out there somewhere. Yes? Yeah, hi. Um, do you have any plans on the out of the box web parts? For what, sorry? The out of the box web parts, for example, search result. And oh, yeah, yeah. So today we've already built, I'm going to make this number up, but I'm going to say it's six or eight out of the box web parts. We start by what are the most commonly used web parts? Boom, boom, boom. We built those. Then we work with a bunch of partners that are actually building web parts, and we will constantly be producing more and more web parts out of the box in the framework. So one of the guys on my team, his full-time job is making sure that we have enough web parts. Uh, I do not want to have the perfect framework and no apps. We've seen that model before. Uh, so I will not be doing that. By the time we ship, I will have apps in the form of web parts, but yes. Uh, one more, and then, yeah. Yeah, well, sorry. What versions of on-prem you're going to be supporting? Sorry? What versions of on-prem? Oh, what versions of on-prem? It'll be the most current version at the time that we ship to on-prem. So no, no backwards compatibility? Uh, in all sincerity, there's no reason why it shouldn't work backwards, but we will make a support statement about the most current version. Uh, yes. Uh, the roadmap for Yammer, please. Is that going to continue to be the social collaboration platform? <laughs> I'm sure. No offense, but there's probably several sessions where someone more capable than I can answer that. I don't know. I, I'm busy building a framework. Sorry. Anybody else? Last one. Can you say a few words about the scope of the other two sessions? Yes. The, the scope of the other two sessions. One is... Um, building a client-side web part where it's a three or 400 level, so it's going to be what we showed you very briefly here, deep dive, Visual Studio Code, running through all the calls that they make, how they load uh, external libraries, how we connect to SharePoint and so on. So that's the nuts and bolts of that. And then the other one is the future of SharePoint development, which is much more an overview of all the things that we're doing, the framework being the most important, but we have webhooks, we have work that we're doing for add-ins, uh, we have a bunch of other things that we're doing. So it's a little bit more holistic for a SharePoint developer, not just framework. Okay, thank you. Okay, with that, thank you very much. Fill out the surveys. There's no one left. I'm just talking to myself. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>